So by the way, the job fair is coming up in two days. So if you're looking for a job, tune in here on Zoom. Um, and you can register in advance, but you don't have to. And uh, there'll be quite a lot of employers there. There's quite a lengthy list. I didn't put them here. But uh, anyway, that'll be a good event to tune into, I guess, on Thursday. Uh, these guys are hiring interns anyway, so a lot of most people are hiring at the same time they're laying off, um, just different areas. Well, they just want the low pay guys. That's true, that's true. Although I think our interns get pretty rudimentary jobs usually. Some of them are actually pretty good, but most of them are pretty beginner jobs, of course. Anyway, so here we are. Um, we've done the first chapter, and we're going to do the second chapter and a little bit of the third because the second is short and the third is very long. And you should be um, turning in your topic by next week and getting ready to do your presentation in a few weeks. By the way, I adjusted the schedule a little bit. I was thinking we'd have a guest speaker on the 7th or 14th, but my guest speaker is coming on the 28th. So I rearranged some of these dates to make room for that. So this will be good. Tim Ryan is a real sec uh, security professional. He runs the network at the college, and he's also a security teacher and a Cisco teacher. And he'll be able to tell us uh, the real world experiences running the network here, which is a good thing. Anyway, so let's uh, pick up with chapter two, which is down here. There we are. All right, come on. There we go. All right, so uh, we'll talk about classifying data, ownership, memory and remanence, data destruction, and data security controls. So um, you have to classify data. Some data is more important than others. If it's the government, you have confidential, secret, and top secret. These are things that are threats to national security. I don't know how I got an N there. Come on. There. And then there's sensitive but unclassified are things that are not threats to national security for official use only. Those are the sort of things that the military and government use in the private sector. They use any different label they like, but it's often things like this, internal company proprietary for things. Um, there's also a separate horizontal control in the government um, called sensitive compartmented information, which means that you should only have access to this stuff if you have a need to know, in addition to sufficient clearance. And here's some examples of some of the terms used for this. Um, these are the things that are only supposed to be viewed in special locations called SCIFs. And this is why it was considered really bad when Trump had some of these things at Mar-a-Lago. And now um, various other presidents and ex-vice -pre ex presidents and presidents have started having documents, although it's not clear if they're as SCI documents. Yeah, yeah, memorabilia. Yeah, but you know, technically he's not supposed to do that. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, he went to France and he stole the things that were left in the room he wasn't supposed to take. Yeah, no, he. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. He just takes what he wants. This is the way the old kings were. You just take what you want. The world is yours. And uh, he seems to be getting away with it fine. The law doesn't seem to apply to him very much. Anyway, um, in the old days, it was just explicit. The king is above the law. Americans pretend it's not true, but in practice, it seems to be true. Well, that's true, but anyway. All right, well, this, anyway, so there's clearance. So clearance is formal determination of whether you can be trusted with information, and they will consider if there's something wrong with you. The most common reasons are drug use or foreign influence. Um, I was surprised to ask my military students if a man who is married cheating on his wife, if that impaired his clearance, they said, no, they don't care about that. They only care if he's got a foreign lover. So they don't, I would. That's a good question. I know in World War II, they considered homosexuality to be a serious problem. I don't know if it would be now. And I, I think logically, I would think it would only be a problem if you're in the closet. Yeah. And if you're out of the closet, you don't have a secret. But I think they don't operate that way. I think they operate on just traditions of what they don't like, not really on set, that kind of simple logic. Closet, then those are like... Yeah, I would think any kind of guilty secret should lower it. But apparently, the people that get it tell me it doesn't work that way at all. They don't do this kind of thinking. Anyway, so formal access approval is the other thing where you get approval to access certain objects in a certain category of information. And... Uh, all right, and so this is when they read you in and explain to you what we're going to see and how you ought to be protecting it and need to know. Um, so even though you're cleared for top secret, you're not supposed to look at things outside your area of, of specialization. All right, then you have sensitive information that should be, should be protected, and this means you have to protect it in use, you have to protect it on computers, you have to protect it in backup storage and printouts and all that jazz. You have to figure out how you're gonna handle it, how you're gonna store it, how long you're gonna keep it, and then how you're gonna destroy it. 
and all those are going to be different for the different levels of security. So as before, there's ownership. Ownership is responsibility. So the business or mission has an owner, and that's senior management, and their job is to accomplish the mission. So they are supposed to make, uh, let's make this thing fit. All right, they are supposed to succeed, and they're supposed to arrange the staffing and everything. They're ultimately responsible for the overall success of the mission or the business. Which is why I say, as you talked about last time, a senior executive that says, a junior staffer did the wrong thing and that's why we got hacked, does not escape responsibility. Why did you put a staffer in charge that wasn't competent? Why didn't you train them or supervise them or replace them? If your staff do bad things, upper management is still responsible for letting that happen. Um, so data owners or information owners, and this is the old sense of ownership, where ownership means a responsibility to take care of something. So yeah, somebody owns the data and that means they're responsible for handling that data, making sure it's properly labeled, properly backed up, properly destroyed at the right time. And then they have a custodian to actually do the work. The custodian does the work, but the owner is responsible for making sure that the custodian is told what to do and supervised correctly. Um, by the way, there's another concept owner in a discretionary access control system, which is a different thing. That's the person who has the ability to share an object. Anyway, um, so a system owner is somebody responsible for a physical computer. So this would be updates, patches, hardware repair, and all that jazz. And again, the owner's responsible for making sure that the physical system is cared for and the custodian actually does the work, but the owner has the responsibility of supervising the custodian and making sure the right work is done. So the custodian does the work and they follow orders from the owner. They do not make dis critical decisions. They, uh, those, that's the responsibility of the owner. And then, of course, you have your users using all your computers, and they have uh, user policies and other procedures and standards telling them they can't share accounts, write down passwords, things like that. And so they have to have uh, training in what their requirements and penalties are. Yeah? If, if it's a small company and there are a few people, yeah. do they, I mean, these rules must be sometimes combined. So are you explicitly yes. both? No. Or you want that also does the other one's work? I mean, how does that work? In practice, small companies don't even know these roles. I worked at a small company, and they said they didn't even know what my title was. They said, give yourself any title you want. If everybody did whatever was necessary. All right. And it wasn't divided didn't you, like this. There's big corporations are the ones that have these nice divisions. Right. Yeah. This is, okay, these terms are already applicable when it's necessary to divide. Yeah, the big corporations. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, this is chapter two, Rohani. All right. Anyway, so... um. All right, so data controllers manage the data. Human resources employees, for example, are controlling all that human resource data, personal information about the employees. Data processors, again, are like the uh, custodians. They manage the data on behalf of the data controllers. And I'll mention with outsourcing, we talked about this last time, you can outsource work, but you cannot outsource responsibility. If you hire some third-party company to do something, that's fine, but you're still responsible for them not losing the data or doing the wrong thing with it. If they do, then it's your fault. Why did you hire somebody that was going to do a bad thing and not supervise them or audit them to make sure they weren't doing the bad thing? All right, so the wisest thing is not collect any extra data you don't need. There was a time 20 years ago when every company would make you fill out a warranty card for every product and collect all the user information from all the users, and people have begun to realize this is not a good idea to collect a whole bunch of information you don't need that now could just get you in trouble if you lose it. Anyway, let's try a Kahoot. Uh, this is 2A. So I gotta go here. Uh, what's the deal here? All right, I'll go here. Now I'm not uh, seeing the window I need. All right, Kahoot. All right, why is this? All right. The window is hiding the button I need. It is hiding the button I need. All right. There it is. All right.
right, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, I think we got everybody that's coming. All right, so what kind of data requires need to know in addition to clearance? Sensitive compartmented information. That's the stuff. All right, who puts on patches? Well, the custodian does the work. These other people are supervisors responsible for making sure that somebody does the work and that it's done right. All right, so who's the manager responsible for putting on the patches or making sure they get put on? <laughs> yeah, the system owner is responsible for maintaining the system. All right, so what about HR people, human resources? What are they? They are data controllers. Some more of these. All right. So memory and remnants. Um, data remnants is data that it remains on a storage medium after you have attempted to erase it. Uh, this is a huge problem. Discarded devices often have old data. The most common flaw being magnetic hard drives, but other devices too might have leftover data. Now, most things that you call memory are things that forget quickly when the power goes off, like RAM and the memory on the CPU chip, uh, like the, the cache or other chips or the registers on the CPU, all these things normally forget within a few seconds when you turn off the power. RAM is volatile, but ROM is not volatile. ROM remembers when the power goes off, but usually there's nothing personal in the ROM, just information about your hardware. <coughs> anyway, by the way, you can freeze RAM and that will make it last longer, up to perhaps 30 minutes, but uh, that's not the common situation. Anyway, uh, SRAM is fast and expensive, DRAM is slower and cheaper, different computers have a different mixture of these, but they all have the same property that when the power goes off, they forget. Firmware is the program that doesn't change, and that's on ROM chips in your BIOS, but that's not anything personal, it's just information about what type of hard drive you have and how to start up the system. Uh, so PROM is programmable read-only memory, the old-fashioned kind, and then there's field programmable devices that can be erased and reprogrammed and flash memory fits in this category, the thumb drives. So this is a type of EEPROM, and they're faster than EEPROMs, but slower than magnetic disks, and they're quite common. You carry these things around, and if they're not encrypted, which they usually are not, then they're a serious risk of data loss. There was a survey a few years ago that said the average executive owns 20 flash drives and has lost 15 of them, which I think is quite common. Sure, you can dump the registry data from uh, from registry itself. You can do a registry backup. 
You can do a system state backup. You can also do it with uh, FTK Imager. Can you it back in? Uh, yes, if you go in the registry, you can export any, all or part of the registry as a reg file, and then you can put it back in. And that's how you can put registry updates. You, it's just a plain text file that lists all the keys. So you can export the registry file, edit it, and re-import it. And that's what... Well, yes, but the registry doesn't usually contain a lot of personal data. We'll see. It contains some information, though. Yes, you, and you can back up the registry. Uh, that's what a system state backup is. So... And if people want to hide, then they can, they can just reload the registry, right? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, that's a good point. You could, in principle, back up the registry, do things, and then restore it to remove a lot of evidence. It wouldn't get all of it, but it would get a lot of it. What yes? Mean, what what, what mean, it will not get all of it? Well, it won't get your internet cache. It won't get your internet cookies. Those are stored elsewhere. It won't get the uh, prefetch folder. It'll get, not all the data is in the registry, but a lot of it is. So if you like, um, you know, turn off the, after you clean up, you turn off the computer, we do restart. Yeah, I mean, if you have something like deep freeze and then restart your machine or you save a virtual machine state and go back, that would apparently get rid of a lot of data. But you might be able to recover some of it from deleted files. Like I say, it would be interesting. There's a project that I don't have in this class yet, but it would be a good project to do something and then make some attempt to hide the evidence and then see how much evidence is left. All right, and I see some Intel Optium memory will last after shutdown. Wow, I didn't know that. What, what, what Optium, he says. Intel Optium will remember after shutdown. I've never heard of that. But uh, what kind of memory? he says Intel Optium. No, what type? I don't know. Uh, no, just RAM, I guess. That seems strange. Yeah, it does seem strange, but uh, maybe a thing to check out. Uh, there's always something. Usually it will be mixed with regular RAM in the RAM slots. My goodness. Okay. Well, that's interesting. All right. So anyway, solid state drives are, of course, what most machines have now. Very few people are still using those rotating magnetic hard drives, or at least not everywhere. So... Uh, SSDs have large block sizes, and the um, blocks are controlled by an SSD controller. And normally, if you have a modern operating system and a modern SSD with the right driver, it does, the controller knows when files are deleted. Optane, not Optane. Not Optane? Optane. Optane. O-P-T-A-N-E. -E. Optane, okay. Yeah, never heard of it. Yeah, Optane, he says. I'll put it in the chat. This is the, and that remembers when the power goes off. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, you look at anyway. So uh, your SSDs um, often have a garbage collection process that erases all the unused files within a few seconds of deleting them, so they really are gone. Um, yeah, it's very hard to thoroughly erase an SSD, as I mentioned before, because um, the computer can't access all the blocks. There are extra blocks of data. If you buy a 100 gigabyte SSD, they give you something like 103 gigabytes, so, and they silently replace bad blocks with other blocks as they fail. So you continue to have 100 gigabytes of usable drive, but the fact is some of your data is in those blocks that turned bad, and you can never reach them to erase them. So you can never thoroughly erase the thing, and you never know it's erased. There is an online controller command, an ATA erase command, that's supposed to physically erase every block, but it can fail, and you have no way to test it. So that's why most companies just physically destroy the storage. They, yes, you, you grind it up with a, a chipper or a, an ax or something. That is the way you know it's gone. Any other attempt to erase it, you don't really know you got it all. All right, so here's this side is the most popular ways to just physically destroy the drive. However, there is another way to do it that works, which is what the iPhone does. The iPhone turns on encryption before you ever start using it. It's always encrypted all the time. And when you want to sell your iPhone, you go to reset to factory defaults, and that erases the key. So all the data is no longer accessible. This is extremely effective, and in practice, it has been tested. There was a forensic company that bought 100 iPhones on eBay, and it tested, and they could not recover any data from any of them. So this is the way to do it. There are some Androids that do this too, but a lot of them do not. And if you wait until you've been using it for a while and then turn on encryption, it doesn't work because then there's some unencrypted data on there that you can't be sure you got off. All right. Um, so to destroy data, you can, deleting a file does not erase its contents. It just makes it available. It's only erased when new data is saved on top of it, which is called shredding or wiping, or on an SSD when the background garbage collection uh, overwrites it. 
Um, all you need is one pass writing on it, but you do need to write on every sector. Um, another thing you can do is try to mechanically uh, use, use a magnetic field directly to just randomize the magnetic particles on the disk. And this, in principle, can be good, but again, it's hard for you to be sure it worked. Yeah? Optane is a crash. Optane crashed? Optane is a crash. Crash memory. Optane. It's flash memory, right. Yeah, that makes it sense. like a 3D, 3D uh, crash, so like high speed. So high speed flash, flash memory, yeah. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, yeah, yeah. That's why it remembers when the power's off, yeah. All right, so you can, in principle, use a high magnetic field to erase tapes on hard drives, but if your magnetic field is not strong enough, you don't get it all, and it's not easy for you to verify. Yeah? So shredding a file on yeah. Unix is actually reliable, that if I shred a file, well, if I do seven, seven overwrites, which is the default? Well, yeah, even one overwrite is enough. The, the, that seven thing is a really old thing from really old generation of drives. Um, one pass is enough that nobody can get the data. All right, well, um, but you do have to really hit every sector. That's the hard part. The command says it does that. But, um, yes. Oh, but it could have been an older copy before the fragmentation. I never thought of that. Yes, of course. An older copy? Well, on Unix, yeah. the, the drive is constantly defragmented. That's right. Which means that there could be a previous copy of the data for the same file. Yes, and, and the same thing is true on Windows. That's why you really have to wipe out the whole volume, and you really have to get every sector. And the problem is, like say, all modern drives have extra, extra sections, segments that they put in without telling you, so you probably can't really reach every segment to erase it. However, you can get most of them. So if you're willing to settle for like 99%, then you can use something like a file shredding program. But if you need 100%, the only thing that works is to physically destroy the drive. Or to have been encrypting it all along, and then delete the key. Yeah. Yeah, and there's your good comments there. Somebody said uh, you should destroy your drive in the microwave, but other people say that's not as good as simply pulverizing and burning, which I think is true. Anyway, something like that. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, so physically destroy the media. This is the most secure thing, and this is what most people do. You use paper shredders to destroy printed data, and you use some kind of mechanical destruction. I know one guy says he rents a log splitter from Home Depot and smashes the drives in a log splitter. You're yep. supposed to recycle the electronics, right? If you smash it, you're not recycling anymore. That's right, you're not recycling it. So, so you have to destroy it, it's not as good as just encrypt it. Yes, encrypting it so you could actually recycle it would be better. Yeah. You're right, be more environmentally friendly. Absolutely. All right, so anyway, let's try another Kahoot, uh, which is uh, 3B. Here it is. Yeah, encrypting is a whole lot cleaner. Yeah, environmentally friendly, less wasteful. You just have to be organized enough to do it, though. Yeah. Well, you could encrypt and destroy, but that seems uh, like overkill, but sure. Yep. He's talking about, a student says when he's in the military, they would degauss and then physically destroy the drives. That sounds good. One issue that hit about eight years ago is people would rent copy machines and they didn't know copy machines had a hard drive in them and they keep a copy of everything you copy. So a rented machine would leave with copies of your documents. People were not were surprised to find that out. Yeah. That's the problem. A lot of devices have data on them that people don't know and uh, they don't realize how much data they're handing to somebody. Yeah, it'd have to be a lot faster. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Good. All right, let's try this one. All right, so what security feature prevents a covert channel? Is this the right one? I don't think we talked about this. No, this is the wrong one, pardon me. This is the wrong one.
We, that's, oh, 3A, we need 2B. Ah, this is better. We'll get to that one later. <laughs> this is the one that ought, should have something to do with the lecture. everybody. Uh -huh. That's why I thought I'd wait a few seconds in case more people are coming. So what component retains data longer when cooled? Okay. Now, by the way, this is a, a little bit of a cruel CISSP question. In principle, of course, everything will last longer when it's cooled. But this is the one where it actually matters in practice, where there is an issue uh, where cooling it will make it last longer and it might affect you, the fact that RAM can remember for half an hour. All right. All right, what device can only be written once? Prom programmable read only memory. All right, which one has garbage collection? If you're discarding an unencrypted SSD, how should you clean it? Physical destruction is the only thing you can do at that point. Encrypting it at this point is going to do no good because there's already unencrypted data on there. And you can't guarantee to overwrite it all. Alright. Show manual. Alright. Okay, same way. All good. Alright. So we got time to go on to the last section here. All right, so data security controls. Um, certification means you meet a certain standard. Um, and accreditation means that the owner accepts that as good enough. So this is, uh, same thing applies to many things, like when you get the CISSP, that's a certification. 
but it would be an accreditation when someone says that that is good enough for you to get a job or something. So there's a lot of standards out there. We've talked about them. PCI for credit cards. Octave is one from Carnegie Mellon U. And the ISO 27000 series that's big and expensive, but it means you can play with the big companies um, if you achieve this certification. And COBIT from ISACA. And ITIL, another one for IT service management. There's just a lot of these. We talked about some of them last time. You'll see them go by again and again. Uh, various standards you can meet, and then you can tell the people you deal do business with, I meet this standard, and therefore my product is good enough for you if they accept that. Some enterprise, HDD has an SED chip for encryption. Yes. But others say the chip isn't as durable as its disks. Yes. That's a big issue. Uh, the cryptographic coprocessor to hide the key is an issue on many platforms. Do the people who never win still get points? Uh, no. Um, only the people who win get points. It's just extra credit. Um, all right. However, the other people can get extra credit by doing more presentations or by going to talks or something, um, or con conferences and things like that. All right. Uh, so uh, scoping. When you do a meet compliance with something like PCI or any of these others, first you have scoping, where you decide what part of the standard applies to you. For example, part of the standard might talk about wireless networks, but you don't use wireless networks, so that's out of scope. You don't have to obey those rules. And then there's tailoring, where you decide how you're going to achieve um, uh, meeting that standard. It is a kind of flexible thing. One thing I heard is when you get PCI compliance, there might be 10 things you're supposed to do, but if there's some that you can't do, if you have a good argument, you can present an argument saying, I don't have this, but I have some compensating thing that means it's okay. You sort of convince them to accept it. It's not as cut and dried as just being 100% right or wrong. All right, and so here's some controls to protect data in motion and at rest. Uh, encrypting storage data protects things at rest. So even if somebody breaks in and steals your physical media, they can't get in because the whole disk is encrypted. Now, a server that's on all the time, it has to have access to the data. So encrypting a server that's on doesn't really accomplish anything. But something that's turned off, like a laptop, it makes sense to encrypt it because people will get it in a turned off condition and they won't have the key. And the breach notifications laws understand this. If you lose a laptop but it was encrypted, you do not need to announce a breach. That doesn't count. Um, well, yeah, so the point is, if you have a server, like a database server, then it has, it's handing out the records. So it has the key, it is decrypting things to hand them out. So if you compromise it with, say, malware while it's running, then you can get all the data, even though the hard drive might be encrypted. Because while it's running, that's the problem. And the same thing is true of your laptop, even if the hard drive's encrypted, if you've logged you in... Get the data in, the memory, then. in the Yes. Uh, and now there, there also, there's two issues. The data in the RAM is not encrypted, and also uh, the machine clearly has the key somewhere to get the data off the hard drive. So while it's running, you can just decrypt the data on the hard drive too. Um, if you get it when the powered off state, that's when hard drive encryption helps. Now there is another issue, by the way. There are up and coming products to encrypt RAM, to encrypt data while it's in use. But those are very exotic and nobody's using them yet. There's a few people trying to do that. So even if you could image the RAM, you still wouldn't get the data. But uh, I don't think any of those are in common use yet. That's a very exotic thing. But if they have the encryption chip on the, on the, on the, on the uh, motherboard, on yeah. The CPU, yeah. That is, you know, they, they, they only decrypt it when wow, it's inside a CPU thing. That's right. So in modern, so if you, you do. They wouldn't even come up into the RAM. Yes. So if you do BitLocker, that's right. If you use BitLocker, then the key is on the trusted platform module. It never enters the RAM. But while you're logged in, you can send an API call and say decrypt this data, and it will. That's why if it's running, they can still get in. But that's the point. If it's powered off, then the key is not anywhere except in the TPM, which is very hard to access. That's why it's considered quite good security. These are very good points. All right, so whole disk encryption is what you should have. And uh, when you transport your data, you have to move the data off-site. Um, 
and you should move it with a company like uh, Iron Mountain. We'll drive a truck, an armored truck, and pick up your tapes and take them away. Uh, don't use casual things like just having random employees driving it around in a normal car because then they'll lose your backup tapes and that's going to expose your data or it'll mean you don't have your backup tapes. Um, can still hack in via MDM access. Uh, yes, that is a problem. Mobile device management um, cons uh, systems have been found to have weaknesses sometimes and sometimes you can take over devices through them. Um, does the security world at, let orgs self-certify? Well, each certification system has different standards. For example, PCI, it depends on how many credit card transactions you do. If you do less than, I think, 50,000 a year, then you just self-certify. You just check a box and they believe you. But if you do a million a year, then they actually have to send an auditor to examine your company. So I think each certification system has different rules. And to some extent, they just believe the company. And so, of course, to protect data in motion, then you use end-to-end -end encryption, like HTTPS, VPNs, and things like that, so that the data moving over a network is protected. All right, let's take a look at the last Kahoot, and then we'll take a break and do the first bit of the next chapter, which is pretty exciting stuff. Um, 2C is here. Seconds. We had 11 or 12 last time. We might have had a couple fall asleep. Ah, okay. Okay. All right, so the international standard. That's the ISO, good. Which one comes from Isaka? That's Cobit. Good. All right. And what process determines what portions of a standard apply to your organization? What do you have to do after a breach? Yep, 
You have to notify people. The victims and government agencies and such like that will have to notify them that you lost the data. That's Melissa. Looks like the real initials, I suppose. And you have. Good. All right. All right. NM. Oh, good. Okay. Good NM tells who it is. That's good. All right. So it's uh, 6.55. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll pick up at 7.05 and do a bit of Chapter 3. Um, not shell code, but Chapter 3 in this class. So I'll be back in 10 minutes. Oh, I'll stop the video this time. I forgot last time and had 10 minutes of silence in the video.